Welcome to Up Close, the research, opinion and analysis podcast from the University of Melbourne, Australia. I'm Shane Huntington. Thanks for joining us. The body's central and peripheral nervous systems, on which we and other mammals so crucially rely, are complex and depend upon the interplay between numerous chemicals to get their work done. Cells are created and later die, signals are transmitted, and the myriad of bodily functions are regulated, all based on these chemical interactions. But one of the most important processes going on in our nervous systems is myelination. To tell us more about myelination, we're joined from Nashville, Tennessee, by Professor Bruce Carter of Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and here in the studio by Dr. Simon Murray from the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology and head of the Neurotrophin Signaling Laboratory, Centre for Neuroscience at the University of Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to Up Close, Bruce and Simon. Thank you, Shane. Thanks. Um, The body essentially, uh, Bruce, if I can start with you, has two nervous systems, has the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Can you give us an idea of the difference between the two and the roles that they play in the body? Sure. The central nervous system is basically the brain and spinal cord, and obviously the brain is involved in higher order thinking and reasoning, while the peripheral nervous system is an older, evolutionarily speaking, an older nervous system, and it will regulate things like heart rate, um, gives us sensory perception, so we know where our limbs are in space, we can feel pain, things like that. Can you give us an idea, Bruce, of um, just how this compares to the nervous systems in other animals that we find, mammals and, and others? Well, in all vertebrates, there's both a peripheral and central nervous system. Lower organisms have more rudimentary nervous systems. For example, the nematode C. elegans is a very crude nervous system. Well, I say crude. I'm sure my colleagues might disagree, but um, it's, it's much more simplified. For example, obviously no brain. Hydra don't even have a really a organized nervous system like we do. Theirs is more of a neural net. But most higher organisms have both a peripheral and a central nervous system. Simon, let me turn to you for a second. Um, can you describe for us what's involved in the nervous system, what makes it up, and, and how it works within the body? Sure. The nervous system consists of a heterogeneous population of cells that have very organized and very discrete connections. Bruce alluded to the sort of relatively disorganized uh, nervous system in a hydra. And as we go through evolution, so the demands of interacting with our environment required a more precise, a more interconnected nervous system. And so as a consequence of this, different heterogeneous populations of cells arose with different particular functions. And in fact, we now see both in the central nervous system, in the peripheral nervous system, segregation of function to particular parts of the nervous system. Uh, these have evolved to become interconnected and to give really a, a whole body or a, um, a more unified sense of purpose to what we do. Let me ask you about myelin. This is um, obviously a material that uh, has been referred to before on Up Close in the previous episode. What is it? Uh, what sort of material is it? And, and what's it there for? So we've been talking about uh, a nervous system and the interconnection of, of neurons in this heterogeneous population of cells. It's important to realise that myelin is actually non-neuronal. It arises from distinct specialised cells within the central nervous system, known as oligodendrocytes, and also in the peripheral nervous system, known as Schwann cells. And I suppose at the most basic level, what myelin is, is a specialised membrane outgrowth of the oligodendrocyte and of the Schwann cell. And what this membrane outgrowth does is that it wraps around or in sheaths neurons themselves in this multi-lamella wrapping, which then actually compacts down on itself and actually fundamentally alters the way nerve signals are propagated down the nerve cell. So can you just clarify what Schwann cells actually are? So Schwann cells are very highly specialised cells within the peripheral nervous system. And their main function, in fact, arguably their only function, is to produce this myelin sheath to wrap around the neuron and to compact down so that uh, it can exert this very specific insulating influence. 
and oligodendrocytes are the same? Very much in the same vein. Oligodendrocytes are really unique to the central nervous system. And they, in essence, do the same thing as, as Schwann cells, but they do it in slightly different biochemical manner. Um, fundamentally, the function of myelin is identical in both the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. If we go back to the early vertebrates when myelin first appeared, the constituent proteins of myelin have in fact changed over time so that in early evolution, myelin protein and and the lipids that make up myelin were relatively uniform in both the peripheral and central nervous system. Now, in humans, the proteins that, uh, that constitute myelin are actually quite different in the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. So over time, over evolution, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells have in fact diversified and generated their own specialisation. And presumably are more than optimised to the particular role they're playing in the two different nervous systems. That's exactly right. Uh, And in fact, it's quite clear now that peripheral myelin cannot substitute for central myelin. In fact, there are quite elegant studies which have shown this to be absolutely true. And I think when discussing myelin, it's important to really identify the impact that it has upon the nerve cell itself. Um, I've alluded to the fact that myelin wraps around or in sheaths uh, a neuron. Now, this is intuitively, it makes you want to think about something like an electrical cable, which is in in sheath by plastic to give it a protective feature. This, to a degree, is true for myelin, but there are important differences, important specialities that myelin confers upon a neuron, which gives it this real advantage, this real specialisation. I think... There are two contexts where it's most informative. The first context is in evolution. And in essence, nervous system function is all about speed. So predatory behaviours and escape behaviours and how a nimble and efficient and quick nervous system will help you adapt to the environment and survive the environment. Now, evolution has thrown up, in fact, two ways to increase the speed of which uh, an electrical impulse runs down a neuron. The first mechanism is by what we call axon gigantism, to grow bigger axons. The speed of which an impulse propagates down an axon is proportional to its diameter. And in some invertebrates, the cephalopods, for example, so we're talking squid, we're talking octopus, they have evolved very large axons to allow them to propagate signals a lot faster. And as a result, they can grow a lot bigger because they can get signals to and from more distant regions in relatively quick time. The second way evolution has thrown up um, the solution to faster conduction is to generate myelin. And it's this myelin sheath that, in essence, increases the speed at which a nerve cell can propagate its electrical information, its impulse. And it does this biochemically. We have to imagine how uh, an unmyelinated neuron propagates its signal, and it does this by a biophysical uh, mechanism called depolarization. So what happens is that the neuron receives a signal, it gets activated, and then it propagates this signal down the length of an axon in a very smooth, in a very coordinated, and it's often referred to in a wave-like fashion. So in this unmyelinated axon, you get this very smooth propagation down the length of its neuron. In a myelinated axon, this is completely different. What myelin does, because it ensheaths or wraps around the neuron, it forces a concentration of these what we call channels. So perhaps my analogy to electric cable is quite misleading to a degree because myelin is not a smooth ensheathment along an axon. It's in fact interspersed with these periodic what we call nodes, or nodes of Ronvier. And these nodes of Ronvier are critically important to how a myelinated axon functions because instead of this smooth, even propagation, you get this jumping of the electrical impulse down the axon. This makes the conduction dramatically quicker, such that in an unmyelinated axon, it might conduct at like one metre per second. If you myelinate that axon, it might conduct at 50 metres a second or 100 metres a second. So there's a substantial increase in speed for really no increase in size. So we've solved the gigantism problem by evolving myelin. 
to increase the speed. Now this has other benefits as well. You might imagine it's metabolically more efficient because you're only depolarizing at these nodes instead of down the whole length of the axon. As a result of being metabolically more efficient, it's also energetically more efficient. So myelin really conferred a significant selectable advantage upon the nervous system to allow us to evolve more complex nervous systems that propagate signals more efficiently and more quickly than would otherwise be the case. And if I could just add to that a little bit, um, myelin is also important for axonal integrity. So if you lose myelin due to a damage or disease or something, the axons start to degenerate. So there seems to be a protective and trophic aspect where the myelin seems to help the axon survive and be robust. Uh, the other thing that I think is fascinating is the differences in the way the central and peripheral myelin promotes regeneration or inhibits it. So in the central nervous system, myelin actually inhibits the regeneration of axons. Uh, that's one of the reasons why after a spinal cord injury, you can't regenerate your, your axons. Among the other inhibitors there, myelin actually blocks that. While on the periphery, it actually helps it. So after a peripheral nerve injury, your neurons will regenerate. The fibers will grow right back along those Schwann cells. They each express unique proteins that regulate that. I'm Shane Huntington, and my guests today on Up Close are Professor Bruce Carter and Dr. Simon Murray. We're talking about myelination, and we're coming to you from the University of Melbourne, Australia. Bruce, specifically, what are the, some of the things that can go wrong with the production and operation of myelin itself? There's a wide range of things that can go wrong. Um, if we start off by talking about the peripheral nervous system, there are a number of diseases that occur as a result of problems with peripheral myelination. Actually, the most common hereditary neuropathy is a disease called Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease. Um, and this is a, a genetic disease. It's really more of a syndrome than a disease because there are multiple forms of it. So it can range from somebody who develops the disease in their 40s and has a problem walking. They just walk a little funny. To other people who have it from birth and are severely disabled and can't walk at all. And there are about 30 different genes that have been identified where there are mutations leading to Charcot-Marie Tooth, but there are many patients still that we don't know what the, the mutation is. There's another peripheral demyelinating condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And this is a, a strange autoimmune condition where different things like, uh, let's say you have a viral infection, for some reason it triggers the immune system to attack the peripheral myelin. And this actually happened to a friend of mine from college. And he had a flu, and then within a couple of weeks, he collapsed in the shower and was totally paralyzed um, because he had lost pretty much all of his peripheral myelin. Both of these conditions, the Guillain-Barre and Charcot-Marie Tooth, are exclusively peripheral. So it doesn't affect your cognitive ability at all. Your brain works fine. The strange thing about the Guillain-Barre syndrome is it almost always completely recovers. So this guy is totally fine now. The myelin reforms, and there's no, no problems after that. Now, in the central nervous system, there are, again, a variety of different conditions. The best example would be multiple sclerosis, which you heard about in a previous podcast. And there are other leukodystrophies where you have uh, demyelination caused by a variety of things that could be virally induced or induced by a, a different series of problems that cause this demyelination in the central nervous system. Bruce, what's happening in these cases? Is the myelin just not forming or is it breaking down? What's what's going wrong? Well, that depends on the specific situation. So in Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, sometimes the myelin will fail to form properly um, and it'll kind of keep trying. So you get these weird myelin structures where you get a little bit of myelin and then it tries to form more and then it's messed up, so the cell degenerates all the myelin. And basically, you get this ongoing condition where you have periods where the myelin will start to form, and then it'll degenerate, and the myelin will go away. And, of course, that leads to axonal problems, or, or the neuron itself has problems uh, as a result. In a situation like Guillain-Barre, or similarly with multiple sclerosis, 
there's an attack of existing myelin and the myelin is stripped away and then that causes problems. So it just depends on the particular disease you're talking about. Bruce, I'd like to talk now about programmed cell death. I assume, as with other parts of the body, this occurs in the nervous system. Right. In fact, during development, you lose about half of the neurons that are generated, and that's just a normal pruning process. What's actually prompting these neural cells to die? Well, that's something that we're, we're actively studying right now. There seems to be two different mechanisms going on. One is that all neurons and glial cells and almost every cell in the body really needs some kind of trophic support. So proteins that bind to the, the cell, the neuron, and keep it alive. And if you don't get that trophic support, then the neurons or other cell types will die. However, there is actually also an active form of cell death where there are proteins on the surface of the cell, like the neuron, that when they're activated, it will kill that neuron. And this also seems to be going on in development where, for example, one of the proteins we're studying is called P75, neurotrophin receptor. So it binds to neurotrophins, which include nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, neurotrophin 3, and neurotrophin 4. And while these factors can promote survival through a different group of receptors, they can bind to P75 and actually cause the neuron to die. And so there's really this balance between a survival support and an active cell death mechanism. Simon, let me um, turn to you for a moment. What differences do we find in terms of the neurotrophins or other nerve growth factors um, between the peripheral and the central nervous systems? And what, what do those differences tell us if they exist? Um, perhaps surprisingly, there aren't a lot of differences between these growth factors that are important in central nervous system and, and peripheral nervous system development and function. And in fact, in the case of the, of the neurotrophins, which Bruce has been talking about, virtually receptors for all the neurotrophins can be found in both the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system. And we're well aware of studies of, of mice in which particular neurotrophin genes or or receptors for the neurotrophins have been deleted, we can see problems with the development of both the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. And that's not to say it's all equal. In fact, I alluded to this heterogeneity of neurons within, within the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And what we find is that particular neurotrophins, nerve growth factor, for example, is really important for the development of one particular class of neurons whereas brain-derived neurotrophic factor is important for the development of a distinct population of neurons within both the central and peripheral nervous systems. Bruce, how do we go about determining what role a particular neurotrophin plays? Is this all petri dish type work or is it done um, sort of indirectly? How do you know which one's doing what? One of the ways people have studied this is by doing a gene deletion. So, for example, if you want to know what BDNF does, you... You knock it out in a mouse and then see what's wrong. The limitation there is uh, when you knock out something that's so fundamentally important, the animal dies. So then there are nifty tricks where you can do a conditional knockout where you knock it out in specific places or at specific times. And that requires a little bit more fancy genetic tricks. But that certainly is a, a major way of seeing in an animal what it's important for. But, you know, the... The experiments done in a dish are also very revealing. We can also kind of go in between an isolated neuron in a dish and a whole animal. There are many studies that take slices of the brain, and they keep the neurons alive in a slice, at least for a short time, and then they can electrically stimulate it or, or manipulate levels of genes in that slice and then look at responses. We're talking about an incredibly dynamic system here. Um, Bruce, when we refer to neurotrophins, are they something that are static in the system or are they themselves evolving like many of the other components? Well, now we talked earlier about worms, C. elegans. It's pretty clear there's no neurotrophins in worms. And that's probably because the simplicity of their nervous system and how small they are, uh, just because you don't need to fine-tune things quite as much as you do in higher organisms. Uh, 
the neurotrophins are actually very highly conserved, though, between a wide range of vertebrate species. In fact, we talked about hydra earlier. Hydra, actually, n- not a vertebrate. It does have uh, something that looks very similar to neurotrophin 3. So neurotrophins have been a part of the, the nervous system from pretty early on, uh, mostly regulating survival and differentiation in the periphery. And then as vertebrates evolved a higher order nervous system, the the central nervous system, the roles there have become more complex, not only regulating survival and differentiation, but even regulating electrical signaling that is thought to be linked to learning and memory. Bruce, are we at the point technologically now where we can control the production and use of neurotrophin in the human body? Well, there's ongoing clinical trials right now where people have designed viral vectors that produce neurotrophins. So in sort of an artificial way, we can control neurotrophins. For example, this would be in relation to Alzheimer's disease. One of the ideas is that if we can increase the amount of nerve growth factor, this might help specific neurons in the brain survive. But in terms of being able to regulate the endogenous neurotrophins, um, no, unfortunately, we're, we're not quite there yet in figuring out how to do that. Bruce, can you just clarify what a viral vector is for us? A viral vector is taking advantage of the fact that viruses can infect cells and stick in foreign genes. So when I was talking about introducing nerve growth factor into the brain, one of the ideas is use a virus, which is modified, of course, to be safe, and uh, inject that into the brain so it will infect neurons or other cell types and then put a gene into that cell like for nerve growth factor, so that the cell will actually start producing nerve growth factor. I just might add there, Shane, uh, Bruce and I are actually engaged with a lab in the Department of Pharmacology here, the the Drug Design Laboratory. And what Tony Hughes does, who's the the head of the lab there, Tony undertakes computer molecular modelling of growth factors to identify important regions upon these growth factors which bind selectively to these receptors and he can model these and make small peptide mimetics of these particular regions. And this is something that Bruce and I have recently been engaged with Tony in identifying. We've already alluded to uh, a neurotrophin called brain-derived neurotrophic factor and Tony has produced a number of mimetics for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And Bruce and I are using these in our work to see if we can more acutely define Um, the nature of the interactions between BDNF and its receptors and exactly what role it's playing when BDNF activates P75, for example, as opposed to its other cognate receptors that that we've alluded to. So, I mean, what do you mean by mimetic? A mimetic is a much smaller protein that is designed to replicate the function of a much larger protein. In essence, what we go about doing is looking at the particular shape of a particular region of a large protein and designing a much smaller protein that can actually replicate a particular shape so it can activate a particular receptor and thereby mimic the function of this much larger protein. And what I mean by peptide is actually a much smaller protein. Ultimately, if you break a protein down, you get into smaller peptides, and then ultimately if you break peptides down, you get into amino acids, which are the building blocks of all proteins. I'm Shane Huntington, and my guests today are Professor Bruce Carter and Dr. Simon Murray. We're talking about myelination here on Up Close, coming to you from the University of Melbourne, Australia. Simon, let me ask you, technologically, over the last sort of decade, what advances have occurred that have perhaps changed the way we go about this sort of work? Well, the genetics has exerted a profound influence. The ability, as Bruce alluded to, to generate mice in which genes are deleted in specific neuronal cell types, or in fact any cell type within the body, has really proved to be critical and provided great insight to our understanding of how uh, the nervous system functions, how myelination proceeds. These are the, the genetic tools that have allowed us to become more definitive and to get a much greater understanding of how these processes are ongoing. Some of these chemicals we're talking about, just how complex are they? Are they the sort of thing that we hope one day to be able to replicate in the pharmacy lab or or are they just 
you know, too complex for us to reproduce? They're not too complex. And in fact, through this computer-aided design, uh, identification of residues within the molecules that are important for receptor activation, we are gaining a substantially greater understanding of the interactions between these molecules and their receptors. So there is, uh, in a sense, a great sort of evolution in our understanding of how these are, are occurring. And this is perhaps best illustrated by some of the early clinical trials that have been undertaken, for example, in, in a disease called motor neuron disease and, and in some peripheral neuropathies. The neurotrophins have been injected into humans in order to promote neuronal survival or in an attempt to promote maintenance of myelination of, of neurons. Now, these clinical trials have been largely unsuccessful, and this is, I think, in part due to the relative size of the molecule. These are relatively large molecules. They're quickly cleared through the kidneys, and there is a complex interaction between different receptor types. And I think we're getting a much more refined view now of how we might go about selectively activating one class of receptors and not another class to really provide greater specificity in the action of what these potential drugs are doing. Bruce, let me just finish up with yourself. Um, what do you see on the horizon for this sort of area of study within the next sort of 10 years? What can we expect to see coming out? Well, one of the fascinating things to me is there's more evidence for the fact that in the brain, myelin is not static, that even in fully mature adults, myelin can be formed and removed in ways that are controlled. So, for example, if you analyze myelin tracks in musicians, um, the more they have practiced, the thicker the myelin that you see. And there's been a number of studies now indicating that the pathways that are used a lot you see more myelin formed. And that's fascinating because we talked about these electrical signals coming from the neuron. Well, of course, they produce those signals in response to other neurons. So if like five neurons are all signaling to one neuron, the speed of the signal coming in is really important because you want them all coming in together if you want to get a big result. But if you have them come in at different times, you get a different kind of level of activity. So if you myelinate something and change the speed at which it's coming, it can have an effect on the output. And I think this is a fascinating area because we've tended to think about myelin as a very static coding on these neurons. But I think what's now beginning to evolve is this idea that actually it's a very plastic and can change a lot. And I think we're going to see more and more of that as the research evolves and, and reveals some of this plasticity that it is there not only in terms of the neurons forming new connections, but in terms of the myelin wrapping around these neurons. And of course, for every upside, which is what Bruce has been talking about, there's also a downside. And in mental health, if you uh, look at the autopsy of major depression, bipolar, one of the commonly observed features is changes in myelin. So whether this this is a bit of a chicken and egg sort of uh, argument, but it's clear that myelin is significantly influencing how neurons function to a degree where it can be extremely beneficial in learning and it can have adverse effects and be at least formally integrated with sort of adverse mental health behaviours. Professor Bruce Carter from Vanderbilt University and Dr Simon Murray from the University of Melbourne, thank you very much for being our guest today on Up Close. Thank you, Shane. My pleasure. For listeners who are interested in myelin and the role it plays in multiple sclerosis, we refer you to episode 105, in which we covered this topic in detail. Relevant links, a full transcript, and more info on this episode can be found at our website at upclose.unimelb.edu.au. Upclose is brought to you by Marketing and Communications of the University of Melbourne, Australia. This episode was recorded on October 26, 2010. Our producers for this episode were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bimmel. Audio engineering in Melbourne was by Gavin Neighbour and in Nashville by Brian Smokler. Background research by Christine Bailey. Up Close is created by Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham. I'm Shane Huntington. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to Up Close. For more information, visit upclose.unimelb.com. .edu.au Copyright 2010 The University of Melbourne